Collins & Co. invite you to join us for our regular lunchtime not-for-profit seminars and workshops. In these sessions, guest speakers deliver expert knowledge on topics specifically catered for the not-for-profit sector. Sessions are held at Collins & Co. from 12 till 2 and lunch is provided. Contact Collins & Co. to find out the next seminar topic and to register. In this seminar, I'll be discussing the internal processes used by Disabled Motorists Australia, a registered charity, to address alleged bullying on its board, the external processes used by the chair of a registered charity, Ananghu Pichanjajara Incorporated, uh, going to the Fair Work Commission to lodge a stop bullying order against a board member. And after some discussion, we'll be discussing the case Swan and Monash Law Book Cooperative, a 2013 case, which His Honour Justice Dixon provides a very useful set of uh, indicators to help charities and not-for-profits avoid these bullying issues in the first place. Thanks very much, Rake, and thanks very much, Michael, and good to see everybody here enjoying dinner and uh, hopefully attentive to what I have to say. I, I've, um, I'm going to break it up for some discussion later on about halfway through, but just to give you an idea of what I'm going to speak about, and perhaps I should introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. Um, yes, we do indeed operate a boutique practice um, focusing only on uh, charities and not-for-profits. We act for charities and not-for-profits, occasionally act for board members who have a difficulty. Uh, and uh, primarily assisting charities with difficulties with government agencies. Um, I chair the Law Institute's Charities and Not-for-Profits Committee, which I founded, um, I'm called the founder about five years ago. Uh, I author a chapter in the Thomson Reuters Not-for-Profit Best Practice Manual, uh, which is a commercial publication. I understand it's $1,500 a pop if you want to subscribe to that service, but um, my chapter is on dispute management. And uh, I've also had a, um, a paper in Professor Miles McGregor Lowndes' uh, annual almanac on legal, legal affairs in, in charities up at QUT. Um, my, my presentation today, which is more of a discussion, I'm going to talk about three cases. The first one is uh, how a charity resolved a bullying issue using internal processes, and that charity is called Disabled Motorists Australia, and I acted for DMA uh, during that time and uh, the difficulties that they had subsequently with the ACNC, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, uh, which went to a Commonwealth Ombudsman's investigation. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. That matter's now closed, so I am free to talk about that. Uh, the second uh, example will be a 19 May Fair Work Commission decision, uh, Mr Adamson, which uh, involves uh, the chair of a registered charity who uh, the Fair Work Commission said was entitled to lodge a stop bullying order against a, a board member on his charity. Um, as it happened, um, the chair had, in the intervening period, resigned from his position, so there was no future risk of bullying, so the matter um, was dismissed. But it's an important case because it says the board member can actually apply for a stop bullying order against another board member. After that, I'm going to open it up, have a, have a wider discussion, and uh, then conclude, having described two processes, an external process and an, and an internal process to resolve bullying issues, uh, I'm going to talk about Swan and Monash Law Book Company, 2013 case. Some of you who have come to the Collins & Co seminars in the past may have heard me speak about Swan. Um, this was a case actually involving two employees of a not-for-profit uh, and there was a Supreme Court of Victoria decision awarding just under $600,000 to um, Ms Swan uh, for bullying conduct um, and the court found it against the uh, not-for-profit, not, not against the perpetrator. And Justice Dixon's judgment, in my opinion, is a really useful almost checklist to help uh, not-for-profits look at their processes and policies to prevent bullying occurring and if bullying does occur, uh, how to address those allegations. So that's my plan um, and hopefully at the end of it you'll have a bit of an understanding of processes to uh, address alleged bullying and uh, processes to prevent bullying occurring in the first place. I'm also going to proceed with an assumption and this is an assumption that we use in our practice and that's, uh, in these cases, these involve members. And we proceed on the assumption that 
the alleged perpetrator and the alleged victim are equally people who support the purposes of their organisation. And it's a big assumption to make, but it's a useful, constructive assumption to make to begin with. Um, it's usual, as you would know, that members of not-for-profits need to sign a membership application which says they support the purposes of, of their uh, association. So I've got a basis to say that's why I make that assumption. Of course, that assumption can be debunked. Um, it can be thrown out and shown to be without basis that, um, uh, for example, the perpetrator has no interest in serving the purposes of the not-for-profit. But I think it's a useful um, approach to take uh, to help uh, rational analysis of what occurs uh, without um, promoting too much defensiveness uh, amongst board members. I hope that's all clear and I'll, I'll start with uh, disabled motorists if, if you're ready. So uh, disabled motorists Australia, they're a registered charity. Uh, in 2014 they came to me uh, with some issues about certain four directors who we call the rogue directors in a paper that was published in Pro Bono News in uh, June 2014. So some of the facts are already known. In this case, uh, the history is these uh, rogue directors over several months made various uh, vexatious allegations against the fifth director whom we call the aggrieved member. And those allegations included financial impropriety, allowing the charity to trade whilst insolvent, possible fraud, uh, and these allegations were first uh, included in board minutes and then later in a letter to the ACNC and when things really ramped up included in, a, in an open letter to all members and also posted on Facebook. And during that time um, the rogue directors simply refused to participate in mediation and grievance processes mandated by the charity's constitution. Even when it was put to them that those processes would actually allow them to articulate and provide substance to their allegations. Of course the charity wants to know and uh, indeed uh, as, as the practitioner if there had been a, an issue, um, financial impropriety or, or whatever, it was something that the charity really ought to know and, and to address. But the rogue directors simply refused to participate and this is one of the problems <coughs> about internal processes uh, if people simply don't want to engage in mediation and grievance processes then unfortunately it might need to go further. So this came to a head in May 2014 when uh, members decided enough is enough. And as some of you might know, it's not a controversial proposition whatsoever, that members can remove directors. They appoint directors and remove directors in not-for-profit membership based organisations. So they followed the process through which included proper notice, having a quorum for those convening the meeting and for those attending the meeting. And uh, we're about to convene the meeting uh, on a Saturday but we received a letter from the Rogue Director's legal practitioner on the Friday uh, claiming that the EGM was invalid because it lacked a quorum. Uh, they also uh, purported to shut out the meeting, the members, uh, from the premises of DMA and uh, the members had to reconvene elsewhere. Uh, we, we wrote, yes, <laughs> um, look, um, you, you, as a lawyer I have to say alleged bullying but um, I, I don't think there's a more clear-cut case of, <laughs> of bullying um, in this case. Um, so we did write a letter back to the practitioner and, and uh, basically said, well, if you want to go ahead with it, or your client wants to go ahead with injunctions, uh, please hand this letter up to them. And that contained uh, the charity's defence. We didn't think uh, there was anything, the quorums were there. It wasn't a big issue. So the EGM, EGM went ahead. Uh, the rogue directors, had they attended, would have been given an opportunity to speak, but they chose not to. And uh, they were removed from office by special resolution unanimously and new directors were put in place. Now that's a, a, a process that charities and not-for-profits can use if they, their rules permit them to do that. Uh, the main requirements really are that you follow the processes scrupulously, you give uh, people an opportunity to speak uh, in, the, in their favour or in their defence. 
Um, the issue only became controversial for DMA when they notified the ACNC on the next working day. Uh, police had been called, there were all sorts of dramas, um, they couldn't gain access to the premises. Um, but uh, the issue came when the President lodged Forms 3A and 3B to the ACNC. These are the forms that uh, a, a charity is obliged to notify the ACNC of a change of directors. Uh, the ACNC wrote back and said, well, we've received conflicting information from the rogue directors and we deem that there's an internal dispute and under section 40-10 of the ACNC Act, um, which says that we can withhold information if it is inaccurate or misleading, we are refusing to uh, process the forms and publish the names of the directors. Now I should um, just quickly say, you, you do have a paper in front of you on the DMA matter, which sets out these things in some detail, and we will email, Collins & Co will email you a PDF of that and a separate paper on the Fair Work Commission tomorrow. So um, you, you can use those. Um, now after some period of attempts to talk to the ACNC, uh, the charity I should say by the way lodged their forms with ASIC as a company and ASIC readily processed the forms notifying of the change of directors because signed minutes were also submitted to ASIC. Um, so over the first year, ACNC, we might generously say, gave DMA a your call is important to us um, approach and eventually DMA decided to lodge a formal complaint with the Federal Ombudsman. That uh, process took 16 months in which it was found that the charity had in fact submitted the forms, uh, there was nothing inaccurate with them and uh, uh, Indeed, they'd followed the processes as they needed to do. The ACNC was given an opportunity to comment and it, it didn't. The Ombudsman's findings were that um, expressed in diplomatic language didn't support the ACNC's contention that it had a right to prevent or withhold the names of directors um, from the charity website of the ACNC under these circumstances. That is, it had a, didn't have a right where it deemed there to be an internal dispute. But the Ombudsman did say that the ACNC has a discretion in a case where material provided to it is, is it's difficult for the ACNC to discern what is the truth and what is correct. So in those circumstances the ACNC can say, well, sorry, we don't know who to believe, so we're going to withhold information until we know. But the only lesson out of that is for a charity that does find it necessary to embark on a general meeting process to remove directors is simply to make sure that your processes are, are scrupulous and the forms that you sign and send to the ACNC are correct because there are penalties for, for providing false information. Um, but the outcome is, is that the charity, it's now beyond controversy that Disabled Motorists Australia was entitled to re remove the rogue directors from office at the EGM and that forms that it submitted to the ACNC were uh, accurate and not misleading. So that's an internal process. It shouldn't be as controversial as it was for DMA in this case, but it's simply to show you this is one process that uh, a not-for-profit could use if it found that uh, its directors or committee members were simply refusing. Uh, there was a case to answer for um, refusing uh, to participate in mediation <coughs> processes where the charity or not-for-profit has some sort of anti-bullying policy in place that applies to, to its committee members and directors and uh, where all else fails, it has the numbers in its members to convene a meeting and make decisions to remove the directors if, if that's what's required. So that's my first, uh, first case. And I, I can. Yes. It's good. The DMA come to you. I'm already have already with the motion, the process in place, or did they come to you with the we've got some rogue directors and we don't know what to do with them? Uh, yeah, the latter. So in fact, the aggrieved member came to me at first. Um, well and truly, I think by that stage, it's fair to say it had become polemicised. So there wasn't really much room for discussion. Um, I did actually have a telephone conversation with 
uh, one of the road directors and in, as far as I'm able to do as a practitioner, I encourage them to uh, put, their, put their case through a process. Um, it's almost laughable and it's probably good to put a little bit of mirth in this without being disrespectful. Um, uh, the road directors also purported to remove the aggrieved member from office and uh, um, they can't actually do that but they can expel a member. So they purported to expel the aggrieved member from DMA entirely. And when I wrote to them and said, well, um, is this true? Um, the aggrieved member is entitled to a disciplinary process where they are able to at least put their case. And um, uh, laughably, sadly, uh, the, the rogue directors wrote back to me and said, well, yes, we have actually uh, removed the aggrieved member from as a member. Um, but we just simply don't have the time to run it through the disciplinary process. And once we have some time, we, we will be back in touch with you. A kind of a shoot first and ask questions later <laughs> type approach. Um, I think that was before they actually engaged a practitioner to, to help them. Um, Gary, yes, John. What's your view on uh, the competence of ACNC? In, in that they didn't have the ability to discern what was later shown to be the truth. Um, yes, that, that's a good question. As, a, as a, I have to um, show professional courtesy, uh, some of it, I don't have to. Um, um, it, it was disappointing, John. It, it was disappointing. I, I expected more, and in fact, um, to begin with, we just thought there had been a mistake. Um, this was a fairly straightforward, uncontroversial decision, membership-based, not-for-profit making a decision, but it just seemed to be become more and more entrenched as we, as we went along. And I'm disappointed that we couldn't sit down and have an eye-to-eye -eye conversation with the, with the senior officers. Okay, so that was meant to, and hopefully gives you one process in the case where you do have a board that's become dysfunctional, alleged bullying, uh, that you could use, and, and where mediation and grievance processes just simply don't work, where you can actually remove a director by way of a general meeting. Just one other question. Yes, Daniel. The process of going from um, the ACNC to the Ombud, mm -hmm. does the Commonwealth Ombudsman that covers mm -hmm. all yes. Commonwealth departments, was, I might have missed it, was there any internal process with the ACNC or anything, or did it go straight to the Ombudsman? Um, there is no formal internal process when it comes to section 40-10 of the ACNC Act. There are some, some internal review processes when it comes to the ACNC refusing to register you as a charity, for example. Um, but uh, the only other resort that the charity had would be to go to federal court and seek, uh, under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act, um, to seek a decision that says that the ACNC failed to take a relevant matter into account. And that that's really the only other avenue that the charity had. And so going beyond this, obviously the, the less costly yes. process yes. first year. Okay. Any other queries about DMO? I will uh, we'll do a compare and contrast with uh, the Fair Work Commission decision. Um, it's, it's interesting these things take a lot of time and I think that's one of the biggest problems with, with these processes because you can imagine a board is in dysfunction for maybe several months and how business is conducted when you've got alleged bullying going on within board members it is, um, beats me. So I'll turn now to um, the Fair Work Commission decision. You don't have that paper and I will send that to Collins & Co tomorrow uh, which sets out the Fair Work Commission decision. This is a 19 May decision, it's called Mr Adamson and it involves the chair of a charity, registered charity called Ananghu Pichandajara Incorporated, which is, as you might guess, an uh, indigenous uh, entity. It's not uh, incorporated under OREC, the Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations. It has its own incorporation statute in South Australia. Now, th there's some history to this case. Um, it began certainly back in 2016. There's a previous case where uh, recorded case where uh, Mr Adamson, who was the chair of APY Incorporated, uh, had some issues with the board members and another board, uh, another member of APY. These issues were around uh, board members not respecting his wishes 
making allegedly defamatory comments, uh, orchestrating events to prevent a quorum, uh, disputes about interpretation of the APY Act, these sorts of things. <coughs> And according to the uh, decision, the initial decision, this went to conciliation in December 2016. There was a statement of recommendations made between the parties and then allegedly those recommendations weren't enacted. So that then meant that Mr Adamson uh, wanted to go ahead with a full hearing at the Fair Work Commission. So this hearing then came about in, in uh, 19 May 2017, so already there's a long period, as you can imagine, from at least December 2016 to, to May 2017. At this point, uh, the uh, defendants raised some jurisdictional issues, and only these jurisdictional issues were decided, but they are important issues. The, uh, as I say, Mr Adamson subsequently resigned as chair, so it became a, a pointless task because there was no future risk of bullying. The jurisdictional issues are around whether Mr Adamson was a worker. Um, as a chair of a not-for-profit or as a charity, was he a worker for the purposes of the Fair Work Act and, uh, and associated acts? So the Fair Work Commission uh, looked at this, this issue and it's a published, publicly available uh, decision but they came to the conclusion that, yes, indeed, Mr Adamson was a worker for the purposes of lodging a stop bullying order. Um, now, th there are specific circumstances in this, but I think they can apply to other board members. Basically, they found that Mr Adamson wasn't an employee. He was, of course, appointed, nominated as chair, the usual processes. The fact that he was actually receiving a, a, um, a, a fee for being a director and a generous car allowance was neither here nor there. It tended to suggest perhaps that he could be subject to direction, but um, it didn't matter because as, as you might be aware, uh, you can be a volunteer and still be um, able to lodge stop bullying orders in certain, in certain cases. But they did find that uh, Mr Adamson was subject to direction from the board. He had certain duties. He needed to travel out and talk to members of the APY community. Uh, he, he needed to undertake certain other activities on behalf of uh, APY Incorporated. He could be subject to direction of the, the board or the executive as it was called. And he could also be subject through a general meeting of members resolution to uh, perform certain work. So it was that direction element in his work that actually in my opinion, um, made Mr Adamson able to satisfy the criteria for being a worker. And indeed, that's how the Fair Work Commission found that, reviewing his activities. Now, we might talk about this later when we um, compare and contrast, but uh, you can imagine, for example, um, a treasurer or a secretary being required to perform certain works. Um, those circumstances might mean that um, they are subject to bullying um, uh, behaviours if, if the requests for them to prepare agendas and books of account are, are unreasonable in the circumstances. So I think the definition of worker could well apply to other members of the committee uh, or boards of management in those circumstances. So, so the Fair Work Commission found that. It's set out in our paper. There are some other steps that one needs to go through. But that was the primary one. Was, was Mr Adamson a worker for the purposes of the Fair Work Act? And the Fair Work Commission found, yes, he, he was, so he was entitled. As I say, uh, by the time the hearing came about, Mr Adamson, I presume, had got fed up with the dysfunction and had resigned. And another step in the process before you can actually apply for a stop bullying order is to show that there's a risk of future bullying. And because he had resigned, the Fair Work Commission said, well, there's no future risk. Um, at least, very incidentally, he might bump into somebody in the corridor, but um, there's no future risk because of he, he's left his position. So there was no need to find whether the substantive claim, whether he was bullied, uh, was actually made out. Uh, there's some problems, and we'll talk about this perhaps in a moment, but um, uh, 
the, the Fair Work Commission did find that he hadn't actually log lodged particulars of the claim. He hadn't actually said what is it that the um, alleged perpetrators had actually done, other than very general things about defaming him and preventing him from discharging his duties. So that's, that's the second process that I'm setting out, that, uh, which is an external process compared to DMA, which is an internal process. You could go to the Fair Work Commission if you can show that a board member is a worker, um, amongst other requirements, and um, seek a stop bullying order there. Now I thought, yes. yes. Even though the chair left, it still doesn't resolve whether there's an underlying issue of competition or is it? But it's still bullying inside the organisation, does it? Mm -hmm. Bullying against one person is gone but then there's no investigation on whether there's actually mm. bullying. Yes, going on. yes. I, I think that's a good point. Be, uh, this, uh, and this will be spelt out more in the next case, Swan and Monash Law Book. There's an onus on a not-for-profit, regardless of whether the complainant says, look, I'm fine, I'm tough, I can tough it out or whatever. For the, there's still an onus to investigate and determine if, if there's bullying going on. In this case, um, Mr Adamson, the Fair Work Commission acknowledged that the complainant didn't actually use an internal complaints process. There's a code of practice under the APY Act, but they didn't use that at all. Um, and it didn't seem to oblige anybody to do anything more. It was, um, it, the story was over once the Commission decided um, that it didn't want to go forward. Now, I, I don't know the precise circumstances uh, whether it was purely personal between this particular Mr Adamson and other members of the board or whether there was an endemic problem. This is something we might talk about too. Um, are you dealing with a sociopath or is there a systemic cultural issue? Um, and I, I don't make judgments about, about that necessarily. In that circumstance, is there a body that's responsible for ensuring that the board does look at the issues that were that arose. So he the first was being bullied as left, but that means that the, the board as such didn't actually address the issues. Mm -hmm. so is there a, an overarching body that needs to ensure that boards don't act like that and then basically just get away with it? Um, the answer is no, there isn't an overarching body. <laughs> in the case of a membership based organisation, and I don't want to at all turn this into a members versus board, mm. but it, you can have members put forward resolutions and member statements depending on the constitution to say, look, we, we need something to happen here. Uh, you can, uh, and I have experience of this where the charities become, in, become so dysfunctional they appoint an independent management consultant who might give a frank assessment of what's going on. But you have to have you know, a resolution of the board as a whole uh, to do that. Uh, we did ask the ACNC initially, uh, this is before the EGM in the case of DMA, whether it wanted to intervene under Governance Standard 2, which requires a charity to be accountable to members. And the ACNC said, well, it's not a serious matter, so um, we, won't, uh, we won't engage. And uh, that, that's a question whether the ACNC provides further guidance, whether it might act in cases of alleged bullying. Um, there is a five-year review coming up with the ACNC. My, I, I would be doubtful if they really had the resources, though, to intervene in all of these things. We did put it to them, even if they put a, um, a voluntary undertaking, required the charity to have another general meeting, and so this could all be discussed by everybody, rogue directors included. Uh, but that, that wasn't available either. Yes. So, Derek, in the case of um, incorporated associations in Victoria, what is the, con the role of Consumer Affairs Victoria in all of this? Uh, their role is to process forms. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because yes. you can go, yes. in the model rules, you can go to them to get a, a mediation. Yes, that, that's true. Uh, the model rules set out a process if and this is a, a procedural thing and getting people to agree to mediate, but you're quite right. It, the model rules say um, that if there's a dispute, the members should meet and try to sort it out themselves. We, in fact, amend our rules slightly to say, if safe, um, I think that's an important. But if that mediation doesn't work, well, then the parties can 
under the rules, the model rules, go to the Dispute Settlement Centre of Victoria and have an independent mediator, which is free, I think. Uh, yep. So you could settle it that way. I, I've attended one of those and uh, um, I, I've, I've watched the parties, different members of the committee yell at each other, write an agreement and literally refuse to sign it at the end, despite all of the hard won work yep. writing it out. But I don't want to suggest that mediation uh, with Dispute Settlement Centre couldn't work. Yes. Does that mean that the board with a bullying and harassment policy, it, that's worthless, a worthless piece of paper? No, not at all. It's not no. No, not at all. on or, or referred to or...? No, n not at all. Um, uh, now, it, it's... Policies and bylaws, it depends on how much substance, uh, if, if it's been approved by members in general meeting, is part of almost the constitution. In DMA's case, it had a bylaw that said members must not engage in bullying, uh, in uh, gossip and innuendo. So that was within its constitution, supported by all of the members. A policy might be a bit more ambiguous. Is it simply created by the CEO, hasn't had approval from the board? or um, so? It, its its weight as being uh, enforceable is it what might be well it, 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 if it's supported by the board a board decision we accept this policy and and uh, and we will uh, monitor it and enforce it that that's a great way to start mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I'm presenting this to you hopefully you'll find it of interest and hopefully you'll think about us when you need some law work but to be perfectly frank if you can keep this out of lawyers and um, regulators, uh, the better. And, uh, and certainly having uh, early intervention through mediation processes and policies set out in, in your constituent documents, that's the best way to go if you can get people to, to sit down. Great. So, so we're, we're just talking through. So it's probably now time to open up the discussion. I've, I've given you the internal and the external processes that you could use. There are other processes oppressive conduct, that's typically used by uh, uh, PTY companies where small companies with shareholders and they can go to court to say that one shareholder is being treated oppressively against the others. But um, Fair Work Commission decision, internal processes that not-for-profits have, um, which are actually set out in the constitutions often, uh, they, are, they are a process that at first instance, it seems to me, um, is the at least worth trying. Even if, you, even if you did go to the Fair Work Commission, which has a requirement, I think, in its legislation that the Commission can take into account any previous attempts at mediation uh, internally, and they might take that into account uh, when it comes to a decision of the Fair Work Commission. And uh, mediation, even if it doesn't actually come to an agreement, it might actually help to uh, distill some of the issues that are actually happening, happening within. Now, I, I, this is the point where before we go on to Swan and Monash Law Book, I thought we might just open up some discussion about this. We've already started that in a way. Uh, and, I, and I'll just suggest a couple of points to begin with. Mr. Adamson, I, I, I know some, as it turns out, I know somebody who knows Mr. Adamson. Um, I know the aggrieved member, having worked with the aggrieved member with DMA for many years, and um, the plaintiff in Swan, Ms Swan, when you read about her in, in the case, all of these people <coughs> are people you would say are capable of standing up for themselves. They're, they're confident, capable, they seem to be um, able to not take any um, uh, inappropriate behaviour, um, yet all of them were subject to bullying or alleged bullying. And I, in my opinion, that fact debunks that myth that goes around that says only wimps um, can be bullied. Only those who can't stand up for themselves uh, are capable of being subject to bullying. And, and I think the contrary applies, actually. You could be an assertive, confident person in many circumstances or most circumstances, and yet in the case of Miss Swan, actually um, being so traumatised by it that you're no longer able to work. So I think that's an important awareness um, that uh, sometimes people who make complaints are seen as being unable to stand up for themselves. 
So that's, a, that's just a comment I'll share with you. Uh, feel free to, uh, to chime in. I've got a few other comments that I can make before going on. Um, in your experience, yes. is the board, the directors on the board, are they sufficiently skilled in these areas? I mean, the sense of being skilled in maybe compliance or HR and finance or employing is one that we would say of all that is being skilled in. Well, in the case of Swan and Monash Law Book, it, the court found that they just had no understanding of what was going on. I'm embarrassed to say Monash Law Book uh, board was, uh, uh, members were lawyers or student lawyers. They realised there was a workplace issue but they didn't act, they just didn't know what to do. Um, so at least in that case, um, the, the question, the answer is no, um, board members don't. They certainly should, even if it's in relation to volunteers, but even when it comes to managing their own board's performance and, and conduct. Um, I can um, give you another example of a board not having experience in this. So a board I know of, um, the CEO is being bullied by a board member around performance, and the, the chair of the board wasn't really sure how to manage it. I got to the point where the CEO ended up resigning, um, a week, no, so in the same board meeting, the board member who was performing the bullying resigned. Um, and so the board turned around and reinstated the CEO and um, asked her to pull back her, her um, resignation. Mm. But the board had no, hadn't even considered the fact that this was bullying, it hadn't registered with them mm. at all that that actually might be something that was going on and they needed to address even though they were aware of the depth of the, um, of the actions against the, the CEO. Yeah. This might be um, an opportunity for, the, for me to draw out the difference between systemic and individual. Um, sometimes people, as we will find in Swan, there is a person who is beyond question engaged in bullying behaviour. Um, and there's no excuse for it, obviously. Uh, but on the other hand, you see that actually they're caught up in a, in a web of their own, not of their own making due to failures of the system. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, I had a client who was a board member uh, of a large charity. As I say, I sometimes act for board members. And this is just a comment before we go on to Swan, uh, where uh, they're a board member and very well regarded independently, independently as being technically proficient in their particular area. And he was also managing a project run by the charity, but he was becoming increasingly frustrated by uh, what he saw was, was the bureaucracy. And uh, uh, there were other paid staff, including staff seconded from a, another organisation. And it, it was recorded as, as he, he in, in a vehement um, uh, and loud voice, said the word fuck. Um, absolutely uh, frustrated with the way um, the project was going. He, he apologised and we recorded that and sent it to the, uh, the board, but in the meantime a staff member uh, took exception to the language and the force in which it was applied and lodged a, a complaint. Now uh, it became on the record that yes he did do that and he apologised for it, but it helped us in preventing him from being completely ejected from the organisation by the fact that there, a year prior there was an independent management consultant's report which was damning on the board and its failure to have um, clear position descriptions and other policies in place as to how this project should be managed and the board had simply not acted um, on those policies. Um, so uh, I, I believe the, uh, the organisation has actually wound up, I think it ran out of funding um, but they evidently hadn't taken heed of the management consultant's advice that there was a systemic problem. Notwithstanding um, our client's language, um, it was simply, uh, you could see within the wider context, the frustration at the entire organisation. <coughs> there was a question before about um, CAV, and you said mm -hmm. you're just a, a forms register, which I'd be glad if they could just reach that bar, to be honest. But <laughs> <laughs> probably another way of thinking about that is how do you see the, the difference or benefit in, in corporate associations versus company 
so it can't be limited by guarantee. Mm. Or whatever. Is there any benefit in a way in that kind of structure in this in these types of situations? <coughs> If we're talking about disputes or alleged bullying within the organ man managing the organisation, the committee or the board, um, very broadly, no, I'd see no, no particular benefit in one or the other. There's a great deal of case law around uh, disputes within not-for-profits requiring uh, people to engage in procedurally fair processes, so it doesn't matter whether it's an association or a company limited by guarantee or some other entity. Procedural fairness, as you might know, very broadly requires uh, the complaint to be put to the other person and the other person have an opportunity to speak to it before an unbiased decision maker, if there's a decision. So, um, and there's also requirements, even recently reaffirmed in New South Wales, that require any decision to be reasonable, or not so unreasonable that a reasonable decision maker would never come to it, to use the legal jargon. So in the case, for example, OE and New South Wales Golf Club, I might have the citation slightly wrong, two years ago, um, uh, uh, Mr OE was a, uh, a, a member of the club and he had been found to have committed a, a major sin when it comes to golfing. I, I don't play golf, but he'd taken his ball, it was in the sand trap and discreetly threw it into a better position. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> so, <laughs> so apparently he had done that twice, it came out, and, uh, and he was removed from the club, expelled actually as a member. And, and uh, he, he objected strenuously. He, he was a, 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 um, a surgeon and he said that he, he obtained some of his business through playing golf with potential clients and it also affected his reputation. And, uh, but the court would have no bar of that and said, well, there was a policy very clearly, it's a rule of, of the golf club that you must not, or if you do have to apparently pick up your ball, you have to notify and declare that you're doing that. And, uh, Despite seemingly being seemingly trivial, it, it really went to the very heart of the game if you would get away with doing that. And given that he had done it before, um, the decision to actually expel him <coughs> rather than suspend him was, was seen as reasonable. So, uh, so there's a great deal of case law around that. And whether you're a company or a, an association, I, I, the, the laws in my view would apply equally to that. There's one qualification, and this occurred with DMA, uh, you might be aware that when the ACNC legislation came through, they actually switched off a part of the Corporations Act, which applies to companies, and it says that um, that section of the uh, Corporations Act, which allowed members to call meetings. So that, that right, that statutory right, is no longer uh, in place for charities that are companies limited by guarantee. But uh, um, despite that, you can have a constitution which is the contract between the rules, between members, that still says uh, we still allow members to convene a meeting subject to a 5% quorum requirement or something like that. Um, and, and we draft our constitutions that way because, in, at least in my opinion, uh, the 5% rule that says you must have a, a quorum of at least 5% to convene such a members meeting prevents the vexatious use of a members meeting. But uh, it can be a useful process, a u useful mechanism, and I'm careful not to say members' rights versus board. It's a useful mechanism for the charity to actually break up board dysfunction if it's become so intractable, whether bullying or not, to have members come in and say, "Well, enough is enough. We need to sort it out." So that would be the major qualification. But other than that, I'd say there's really no difference, very generally, between associations or companies. Long, long answer to your question. <coughs> um, I, I, a couple of other points before I move on. Um, uh, th th there is some research out there that says, uh, in relation to family dynamics, that says the, the ideal family uh, isn't necessarily the, the family that has a peaceful and tranquil existence. You can have families that work uh, who argue with each other, even strenuously, about matters, 
um, without impugning the integrity or uh, um, having people feel threatened. Um, so the, I've heard the discussion that, oh, you can have robust debate in, in a board. Uh, of course you can, it, but there's a point where robust debate is no longer robust debate. It's actually impugning integrity of individuals. There's an apocryphal story, of, it's in the public domain, about the Costello family. Uh, Tim and Peter Costello, apparently, it's part of the myth, I think the Costello myth, um, would argue about social justice and uh, growing the economy, and you can imagine which, which Costello um, was advocating the positions, but they would argue at the dinner table and at the breakfast table, and their parents would encourage that, and that's actually what's um, allow them to practice their debating skills and without um, obviously destroying brotherly love. So, so there's room for robust debate, but uh, I think it's fairly clear that you can move into something that's no longer robust debate and using that phrase robust debate to cover over something that's it's more insidious is something one has to be careful about. So there, there um, oh the only other bit of research uh, I've found that I can't cite either, but apparently, and this is where I might throw away my assumptions about assuming that people, the alleged perpetrators and the alleged uh, victims are still wanting to somehow serve the purpose of the organisation. And that's that research you might have seen that says that sociopaths and narcissists tend to gravitate to positions of power, including on boards and uh, including lawyers apparently too. Um, <laughs> but uh, So that's another piece of research to just keep in mind. It certainly um, I take with a grain of salt the idea that everyone in not-for-profits is, is, is wanting to do the right thing. It, it, it needs to be acknowledged that you do have people with problems uh, who do come to, to boards just like as you do anywhere else in society. So if, unless there are any further Discussion. I'll move on to Swan and Monash Law Book, if you like. Butte. I should say, does everyone understand what bullying actually means? Yeah. Define. Just quickly define it. Uh, here, here we are talking about bullying. The Fair Work Act uh, says that bullying is conduct that is repeated, unreasonable, and poses a risk to safety. Uh, the latter part of the definition, uh, uh, the risk to safety, doesn't have a high threshold according to the Fair Work Commission, so you don't have to come in with a doctor's certificate to say I've got PTSD, therefore I've been bullied. It's just simply that there's a foreseeable risk that you might suffer some, some risk. Um, the unreasonable, well it depends on the context and, and the Fair Work Commission, the Fair Work Act actually says performance management is reasonable conduct for avoidance of any doubt. So there's a distinction between unreasonable conduct and performance management. The other aspect of bullying is that it has to be repeated. A one-off uh, exhortation or exclamation of bad language isn't necessarily going to be bullying in its own right. The Fair Work Commission has a bench book, anti-bullying bench book, which you can uh, obtain and it sets out a whole range of potential uh, conduct that could, given the context, be bullying, and that includes victimisation, gossip and innu innuendo, uh, yelling, uh, things directed directly at the person, the, the alleged victim, but it can also include things like gossiping behind the person's back, e excluding them from work functions if, if it's on a repeated basis, so that gives you a bit of an idea. Oh, I know that it's um, mainly directed at workers, but workers directing it at board members. Mm. Would that, do you think that the um, Fair Work Commission could cover that? Yes, mm. it's still a worker, aren't they, the employee? Yeah. Yes, and given okay. what we know, um, the act, I think it actually says worker and then it says individuals, so it could be directed at somebody other than another worker, yes. Okay, well I'll, I'll move on to Swan, Swan and Monash Law Book, and apologies to those of you who have come to Collins & Co conferences in the past and have heard this before, but it was published, uh, it's a well-known case, 2013 went to the Supreme Court in Victoria. Now the facts, the history of it is I think back in 2005, 2003, uh, Monash Law Book, or Ledgy book as it was trading as, as a not-for-profit. It was operating a retail bookshop selling law books. 
It had a, a board of lawyers and uh, student lawyers and it employed two people who their titles were manager and assistant manager and the plaintiff, Ms Swan, was, had the title of assistant manager. But from almost the word go in 2003 until 2007 when she left, uh, she, she experienced difficulties with the manager. And those difficulties included being yelled at, being given a, a desk to work that was difficult to work from and, and kept her out of the flow of the organisation. Um, and it, it got worse to the point of where the manager threw a book at, uh, at the plaintiff, Ms Swan. But that was over a long period of time, five years, that it was episodic, so it came and went. And Ms Swan uh, initially went to the board and said, well, look, there's a problem, but uh, basically, if you're going to look at it, I'm, I'm okay with it as long as you look at it. She didn't want to lodge a formal complaint. But the board, as the court found, didn't look at it. It just said, oh, well, hopefully it'll blow over. And uh, given that Ms Swan is happy, uh, we won't go any further with it. The court said, well, there was a foreseeable risk. You should have actually gone ahead and made some sort of investigation. Um, but that didn't happen. So it, it went on. And uh, when, it, when it finally came to it, Ms Swan resigned. And uh, she was successful in obtaining a judgment in her favour. The uh, manager uh, was found by the court to have engaged in bullying conduct over that period of time. Uh, there's a litany, if you want to read the, the judgment, of different behaviours, but basically intimidating, belittling, speaking ill of Ms Swan, including yelling, yelling and throwing the book. He, uh, it's recorded in the judgment that he claimed that he had tossed the book at Ms Swan, but the court didn't accept that and said, no, you actually threw the book. Um, so there's no doubt that the manager had bullied um, in the eyes of the court. But the court actually found against the Legi book, Monash Law Book, because of the systems, the system, the systemic failure of Legi book. Very early on, Legi book realised in the first complaints that it had a problem they called role ambiguity. They had encouraged the assistant manager and the manager to be equals, and they particularly encouraged the, the assistant manager to be regarded on equal terms to the manager. The manager didn't know this. Um, the assistant manager was even given particular projects to, and was expected to report directly to the board. And the assistant manager, Ms Swan, was invited to board functions. So she began assuming, um, with, with reason, that she had equal weight to equal authority as the manager. And the manager didn't know this until much later when uh, the court case came about. So uh, without excusing the manager's uh, bullying behaviour, uh, he, he really ought to have recognised he was getting angry and taken some anger management or discussed it with, with the board. But without excusing that, you can actually start to see how he became so frustrated. Why wasn't the assistant manager taking my directions sort of thing? So, uh, so this was a problem, and I can imagine a volunteer board, peace, love, we want everyone to be happy and enjoying their workplace and we want to treat everyone as equals, but it actually created a problem. Um, so this was the analysis of Justice Dixon. He found, yes, bullying occurred, but there was a systemic problem within the organisation, which was an accident waiting to happen and, and therefore Ledger Book itself was liable. Now, the, the wonderful thing about this judgment is that Justice Dixon sets out, within the context of the bullying, a, a list of, uh, if you like, a, a checklist that, I, in my opinion, is really helpful to not-for-profits, to design systems to prevent these sorts of things from happening in the first place. Um, so I might just read them out. You'll, you'll have this paper tomorrow. But um, His Honour, Honour Justice Dixon said that the Ledgy book failed to clarify different notions of employee status. Was the manager Ms Swan's manager or, or an equal co uh, colleague? Um, it failed to stop making repeated misrepresentations to Ms Swan that it w was going to do something about it, when in fact it didn't do anything about it. It said it was going to, but it didn't. Um, it stopped, uh, it, it never provided written job descriptions or workplace behaviour policies uh, at, at all. Um, 
It failed to properly define relations between the board and the employees. As you recall, Ms Swan was able to talk directly to the board, um, so she formed a view that she was reporting to the board and didn't need to report to the manager. Um, it failed, the board failed to act when it was clear that the manager had developed arbitrary and brusque work practices and that uh, the want of written position descriptions was actually contributing to those brusque practices. Failed to directly invest, when we move now into the investigation, directly investigate what was occurring and it instead relied on the choices of Miss Swan who said, look, I'm, I'm fine, I can tough this out, providing you do something about it and they took that as is sufficient and so the court said there was still a foreseeable risk you needed to get in there and sort it out and investigate um, it also failed uh, according to Justice Dixon uh, to even just simply give an informal have an informal discussion with the manager simply hey let's go and have a coffee there's some problem here L I'd like to hear your view of it did you know that the assistant manager is actually doing some projects for us that might have been a revelation for the manager. Oh, now I know, now I understand why I'm not getting any uh, responses. Um, who knows? But the court said you could have even just had an informal thing. You did, don't have to go through the full investigation. You just put in your performance review mm -hmm. or just an informal coffee catch up. Um, it failed to articulate expectations of workplace conduct, it didn't have policies. Um, it didn't have a defined complaint procedure, so if there was an issue, uh, either Ms Swan or the manager could have initiated a complaint. Um, it didn't have an employee assessment process, so it could actually get some formal feedback. Um, and it failed to train its board to um, understand bullying and processes to address bullying. So th that's Justice Dixon's, uh, if you like, hit list. Now, He's applying it to employees of a not-for-profit, but I think you can pretty readily apply these same uh, principles or um, actions uh, to the boards of not-for-profits. So uh, if we go back to APY, Mr Adamson, he, he had a defined role as chair to go out on behalf of APY and talk to Pitch and Tajara um, uh, members, Indigenous people. Uh, so he had a, a role and uh, so that was expected of him. So he understood what he was required to do and if board members were somehow preventing him from doing that by allegedly bullying, well it was preventing him from actually doing his, doing his role. Um, so having some policies in place about uh, what is expected of individual board members. You might well be aware, uh, this is something I come up with, uh, that there's a duty on all, whether you've got a formal position as a treasurer or a chair or a secretary, as a director or committee member, you've got a duty to exercise independent judgment when you come to making decisions. It doesn't mean you should act contrarily to the consensus or a majority view, but if you come to a reasoned uh, position, uh, then that should be supported by the board and you shouldn't be uh, bullied into somehow abandoning that view uh, because there's this desire for consensus uh, rather than simply allowing the person to re record a vote of abstaining or um, not agreeing to. Just if any director ensures that all the other ensures that they have a good thing, the directors aren't a purpose because they're not aware of the governance around bullying and the insurance company's going to view that and say, well, you're not fit to be a director because you don't know what your duties are. Oh, no, that's, a, that's one out I wasn't expecting, Gordon, but I, yeah, I think that's... Given that Swan, uh, there's a $600,000 payout to Ms Swan, um, now that was an employee arrangement, but um, I, I, it would be interesting to have a conversation with the insurer and say, what do you expect here? What, what would uh, uh, prevent you from paying out if, if we, uh, as board members, simply failed or refused to, to participate in governance training around bullying or um, uh, there might be circumstances where the conduct is so willful that it actually negates the, the insurance cover. Um, there, there are, most of the time as directors and committee members you will be covered by your insurance but there are exclusions and exceptions, um, particularly if there's something willful, if you're a director who's act, acting outside of their position, 
um, insurance might not cover that. So there might be circumstances there. Um, yeah, it might be worth. That's a good question. It might be insurers in the end who um, push boards to uh, oh, to sorry, improve. I just work at NDS and I'm on the conference. And one of that board meetings, I've been brought up in that board meetings and checklist for their goodness. Uh, That's that's an interesting question to uh, might be to take up. I, I, I haven't got experience with that. Uh, our insurers uh, for our law practice, they run seminars on risk management and they expect you or say it will help protect you if you have checklists, you know, if you're doing conveyancing, that you, the technicals, but uh, when it comes to human resources, that's another issue. That, um, that's probably worth, I can't answer that or provide, but I think that's a great question, Gordon. Well, yes. Gordon, did you say it was the NDIS? No, NDS. NDS. So I didn't work within the NDS, uh, but as I said, I was, I was employed, I was contracted to do some work with a, uh, a supplier of the NDIS, and part of that was doing some surveys for the clients and for the employees, and how that we knew there was bullying going on, but we were trying to get down to what that bullying perhaps was. It was actually the actually the clients, the participants bullying the staff, wasn't the staff bullying the staff. <coughs> right, so it was a reverse way down. Mm -hmm. We fed those results back to the board and I was sat down at the board meeting, I presented it to the board, got allowed to stay at the board meeting, part of that was the governance, and they did a checklist mm -hmm. and that was bullying. And I raised the question that, mm -hmm. is that bullying in turn, was that bullying? Because I couldn't understand how the board's responsibility was for participants bullying the staff. Mm -hmm. so they went through the whole process of that, so... Uh. Yeah, given the Fair Work Commission that says a board member could, could be bullied or an employee mm -hmm. could bully a board member, um, it might be worth checking that out, whether insurers are amending their, their contracts or advice. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question though, because if, if it does come to the point where it's necessary to do a payout, well... No, no. So if they if they said, well, look, you, you know, you, you ought to have done this, um, I think they might rely on a court decision. But uh, usually, well, in this case, they didn't find against the employee in Swan. Uh, it was the not-for-profit that had to pay up. So, um, yeah, that's no, an interesting. Uh, maybe I'd pose it as another way. Where does the <coughs> individual liability of directors and and committee members fall? If, if uh, the, the not-for-profit cover, indemnity, isn't going to cover them for, for um, failures of the systemic failures. And, um, very broadly, I give advice to directors that uh, if you act right outside of the terms of your position or uh, disobey um, policies, uh, it has to be pretty serious, but you might be exposing yourself personally uh, and you won't have cover. Now that, that's an interesting question. If you had a board member who, who was uh, beyond question engaging in bullying conduct and disobeyed board instructions or refused to participate in mediation as we have here, um, whether the insurer might decline to cover them in that case, cover their expenses. Well, we're getting near time. Um, I've the, I'm certainly happy to take a few more comments, but uh, my purpose today has been to give you two cases, uh, two processes that uh, disabled motorists used an internal process, failed mediation but was successful with its extraordinary general meeting to address bullying, uh, and uh, the external process where Mr Adamson went to the Fair Work Commission and the Commission said yes you are entitled to lodge a stop bullying order even though um, you, you're a board member, uh, you're, you are a worker. And I've also given you Swan and Monash Law Book which you will have in the paper tomorrow which is, it really sets out, in my view, a really useful checklist uh, from Justice Dixon that you can apply to um, processes to prevent bullying occurring in the boardroom. Um, I, I think um, that the important things in to prevent bullying in a boardroom is actually to have good meeting procedure 
there's half the time and, and everyone signing off on a code of conduct and work, workshopping on that. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think having a good chair is a good thing too. A chair who's, who will encourage different points of view but, and will try to synthesise those points of view, perhaps using a, a code, um, that, that can help as well. Um, but if, if you have people, it becomes a free-for-all. And look, I, 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 mea culpa, I, I have trouble managing my anger sometimes. Uh, I'm a com committee member of a, an owner's corporation. Uh, my wife and I have a unit and... Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but um, th there aren't processes. It becomes a free for all. It can become white ants and all horrible emails in capitals, and you know, all it, and simply having some rules set out um, about what's acceptable conduct. Um, I couldn't agree more, Karen. In fact, um, Professor McGregor Lowndes, in one of his papers up at QUT, talks about disputes generally occurring in not for profits because. Sometimes uh, board members just don't have the normative experience. They don't have experience of what's expected as a board member um, to speak. And uh, you know, it can encourage robust debate, but it doesn't mean personal attacks or those sorts of things. Now, if, if we don't have anything more, I'd just like to close. These things can be terribly hard, um, even for lawyers, uh, trying to synthesise and work out what's going on. And if you don't have people wanting to follow the rules, well then it becomes, it's impossible to work out. But I, I just want to close with a, one of the most satisfying little stories that I have, and it, I actually have trouble um, composing myself sometimes, but this was a, a small not-for-profit, not a charity. Uh, there was an event going on where things needed to be done, and the president directed the secretary to go and do something and the secretary decided that he knew a better way of doing it, so he went and did something else. And the president, over everybody, yelled out some abusive uh, language, telling the president, the secretary what he should do, and he's disobeyed him. And uh, that's what happened. Subsequently, there was a great exchange of letters from the secretary and the president, both saying, we're resigning, we've had enough of this, not prepared to serve on a voluntary committee anymore. And uh, the committee didn't really know what to do. Um, they had a talk with me, and uh, my small credit is that I helped mediate it, but the, the, all the credit really goes to the president and the secretary who agreed to actually have a face-to-face -face discussion. And uh, in, in that discussion, I basically said, well, this is what, what's occurred, this is the facts. Um, the president said this, the secretary went and did something else, uh, the president then said that, and uh, now there's... So, um, so the, what happened was the president uh, shook hands with the secretary and apologised for his um, abusive language, and he didn't, said he didn't mean to do that. And the secretary equally uh, shook hands and said, well, look, I did think there was a better way, but I had no, no wish to undermine your authority. And uh, so they, they made up, as it were. Um, the committee then decided that next time they have these sorts of events, they will appoint a project manager, somebody who knows, who is entitled to give directions and from whom you can ask for directions, and that's resolved the problem. The, the bit um, that touches me is, is the uh, chair, the president, actually died of a, um, at the time, uh, a, a terminal illness um, about a year later. And uh, the secretary went to the funeral and uh, he, he said, you know, I was so glad that we sorted this out before he died. So, uh, so that's one of those little satisfactions that helps energise me when dealing with these things, that there is some sort of um, satisfactory resolution one way or another. So if there's no further questions or discussion, we can finish the meeting. Oh, sorry. Yes, <coughs> oh, <laughs> OK. You go first. I've already asked a couple. Oh, mine's pretty quick. Is anybody actually looking at um, some more regulatory frameworks around not-for-profit boards, law institute, government, anything? Like there is just, from just my experience, a number of boards that are actually gone quite rogue, as you mm -hmm. use the term, who are acting outside what is appropriate behaviours for boards, bullying, conflict of interest, a range of different issues. Is anybody looking at that? Because it just doesn't seem to be anywhere to go when a board goes way outside yes. its purpose. 
I, I, I agree. Um, some lawyers won't handle internal disputes. Justice Connect, whom you may know, they have a public policy that says we just won't handle internal disputes. So it can be hard to find places to go. Um, the Ombudsman's uh, report to DMA, which uh, it's not public, but, uh, but it did say that the ACNC is looking at dispute processes, um, which it will put on its website at one stage, at some stage. Uh, I, I will imagine that I'll have an opportunity uh, through other ways to comment on that. Uh, to be quite frank, I don't know whether, I don't have much faith in the ACNC. It doesn't have jurisdiction to do these things anyway. Um, but there, uh, that really is about, all, about it at the moment. I'm sorry to say, but look, there's an ACNC five year review coming up. Um, Professor McGregor Lowndes uh, does quite a bit of work about disputes and maybe there's some other way of uh, um, helping not-for-profits through these things. Because I, uh, without getting too much on my high horse, I almost see it as a breakdown of civil society when you, you see people um, just simply being unable to talk through something that's, uh, that's bugging them. And, and but, so the answer is no at the moment, okay. sorry. Um, the, going back to the issue that um, Michael raised earlier about, you know, boarding that might happen between a CEO and a board, either way, I suppose. Um, is, I, I think most CEOs in the not-for-profit sector are not members of the board or the management mm -hmm. committee. They tend to be separate. Mm -hmm. Do you see any benefit either way in being um, a member of the board or not? It's, I think it's more common in the private sector. Yes. Um, well, to be, let's just assume that to be a board member, you need to be a member of the organisation. So you've signed on. So you're more, you're bound by the contract, the constitution. So if you, you were an employee uh, and you also became a member of the board and perhaps therefore a member of the charity, uh, you could use the processes in your constitution to address these things. So this uh, board member who uh, swore at a staff member, I gave that example, um, they were a member of the charity and they also had a project job. I think they, there's a volunteer position. So there were two ways the charity could address his language. Um, uh, so it perhaps opens up some opportunities or um, avenues to, to, uh, for me mediation and grievance. But this, this perhaps maybe gets more at that uh, what's the role of the CEO and what's the role of the board type question. Uh, you know, the, the board is responsible for strategy and the, the CEO is, is empowered by the board to implement that strategy and sometimes um, there might be a conflict there and it might be better that the CEO is actually separate from, from board. But I, I know there are plenty of very passionate CEOs out there who are the founders of not-for-profits and charities and they want to be on the board and um, how that's managed is a, can be quite vexing, uh, quite frankly. Mm. Yeah, but I can't give you a one-size-fits-all, sure. I'll pray. Daniel, yes. <laughs> Usually um, an expectation, if anybody's on a board, they choose to go on it and uh, <coughs> the expectation is if you don't like the way it's operating and everything, you can choose to get off it. But it's complicated, I think, in the not-for-profit sector in that often you know, there's, there's a reason you're on it because you believe in what it's doing and then <coughs> you sort of wipe your hands of it and just walk away. Uh, it's a breach for a lot of people because they see it making progress, particularly if they've been working on various projects and things to get it to make that progress. It, it really is a grey area because you're not an employee, but you're just there almost of your own will. And yet, um, as you've just outlined, people can dish out a lot of damage if they're acting the wrong way. I agree, and that's that's why why should we. Um, just advise people, look, just walk away, put in your resignation. It, it's not necessarily going to do that person any good. In fact, this person who used the strong language was seeing a psychiatrist at the time for the stress. And uh, I had to be very careful actually not to advise him to uh, resign because I thought he would do some self-harm. Um, because people are very passionate. And if you can find a way to 
energize and direct and um, encourage that passion, um, all the better. So, um, but I, I agree, Rosalind, that, that sometimes um, it just becomes so impossible that your own health comes first and you have to leave. But, um, and that's the tragedy because <coughs> so many people have different skills and energies and passions to bring to a board and a volunteer board and uh, if they give up and say, well, I've had enough of this and I'm out, um, that's, that's a loss for them and for the, for the not-for-profit. And also it lets, lets the role doers just keep going because one ex um, um, ex anecdote that I heard from someone else with a, a big community health organisation with a lot of money and a board member felt very uncomfortable about what was happening there and he chose to leave but it means the people who were working all these deals and things could simply keep going. There was no whistle. <coughs> yes. No, I, I understand that. Um, I can't provide the cure, <laughs> but no, it, it's if that doesn't happen, if that can be prevented from happening, that that's a good thing. I, I actually resigned from a PTY company um, board some time ago, where uh, I wasn't its lawyer, but uh, uh, a transaction was presented for us to approve, and I said I wasn't comfortable with it, and I'd like their lawyer to to have a look at it. And that lawyer's, uh, there was resistance. There was uh, eventually a written advice which tend to confirm my concerns. It, it didn't say, no, the transaction shouldn't go ahead, but it, the circumstances. And uh, then over a period of about 24 hours, the CEO, after hours, the different board members started viewing me as a holdout type person. And uh, uh, even after hours calling me and um, you know, working me over, I, I felt, harassing me, and uh, I ended up resigning. Um, that was the best thing to do. Uh, of course, if that transaction was illegal, um, uh, I probably would have copped it more than any of the other board members anyway. As a lawyer, you know, the standard of care is a bit higher. Because um, you are liable for, is it 12 months? Um, in yes, it can be, yes. yes. If they make a decision and you're on that board, you're wearing it. So, yeah, look, it's a shame. I, I, I can only acknowledge that, Rosalind. I can't necessarily <laughs> provide an answer. Um, yes. Are there any figures um, relating to the number of volunteers in organisations in Australia, like comparing to the other workforce? Because I think there's an awful lot out there that <coughs> struggle along yes. sometimes. I'm sure there are figures. I can't give them to you. Yes, I was just wondering because I think it's huge. Well, we, you know, we're kind of talking small pieces at the moment. But I was just thinking yes. of everybody that I know for the last few years that could be in a position like this. Well, there are reportedly 600,000 not-for-profits in Australia, of which 50,000 are charities. So if you extrapolate by five board members on each, it's yeah. quite a lot. Um, it's not just board members either. It's other volunteers as well, mm -hmm. yeah. that are yes. on the other end, sometimes on the other end, suffer. Some not-for-profits do uh, try to treat uh, volunteers the same as employees, and the workplace, the Fair Work Act actually does recognise volunteers as, as being That's able right. to, yeah. Yeah. in certain yeah. cases. Um, no, no. Um, yeah. Perhaps that might... Thanks for your comments, Lynn. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. That's uh, right. That was really um, informative. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to come and present to us. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.